everybody. Welcome to our zine history and making program. Um, my name is Ruya. I work at the New Carrollton Branch Library, um, and this is Natalie. Um, we're going to start off with a presentation on the history of zine, um, and then I'm going to walk you through how to physically make an eight-page zine, um, and then Natalie is going to make the demonstrate how to make the content for us. All right. LGBTQ plus scenes, finding community in a pre-internet world. So what is a zine? The answer is it can be pretty much anything. Um, physically, it's like a little book, like a little, little magazine. Um, the only real rule is that it has to be self-published. If it's made by a big publishing company, it's not a zine. Um, but beyond that, pretty much the sky is the limit. It can contain writing, um, a lot of poetry in zines, a lot of um, prose, um, a lot of like short fiction. It can contain photos, photo collages, um, a lot of zines in the uh, 80s and 90s had um, photos or like cutouts from magazines in them. Um, it can also contain comics. Um, and sort of tange tangentially, um, comics actually, especially autobiographical comics, have um, a place, their own place of importance in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, as early as the 1940s, right around the time the first Captain America comic was published in the United States, a, car a cartoonist named Talco Laxonin was publishing the first um, kind of subtextually, but still um, LGBTQ plus comics in Finland. Um, he did um, like sort of homoerotic comics of like big burly men like staring at each other um, where, like, if you don't know what's going on, then it, it's not, like, visibly gay. Um, but for people in the know, they would understand, oh, yeah, like, these men are, like, attracted to each other. Um, and then, of course, Alison Bechtel's autobiographical comic strip um, ran in several zines and uh, underground gay newspapers in the 1980s, um, and that and her 2006 memoir, Fun Home, uh, which was of course made into a musical, um, have influenced a whole generation of LGBTQ plus creators. Uh, many of the most lauded graphic novelists of today Tilly Walden, Maya Kobabe, uh, Maggie Thrash, to name just a few, um, are members of the LGBTQ plus community who chose to draw, literally, uh, directly from their personal experience in the form of memoir. Um, the visual medium of comics has always allowed the LGBTQ plus community, a group that has traditionally seen itself excluded from representation, in mainstream media to literally draw themselves into the media they create and be the representation that they want to see. All right, so the very first zine, Fire, let me, I see through view so I can see what I'm indicating, um, was, created during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, black writers and artists were rejected by white publishing houses due to racism 
Um, and so they were like, we're going to create our own publications um, and share our writing and our art ourselves. Um, and a lot of the contributors to FIRE were members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and the zine was full of homoerotic subtext, um, with the exception of a select few, such as Richard Bruce Nugent, who was a very interesting figure, um, who uh, wrote a lot of really great, openly gay uh, fiction. Um, most of them were closeted. Um, Langston Hughes himself was likely gay. Um, but the gayness of many artists of the Harlem Renaissance was sort of an open secret where everybody knew, but they didn't really talk about it. Since then, zines have been a popular creative outlet for the marginalized people of color and the LGBTQ plus community. Statistics show that people of color and the LGBTQ plus community tend to be lower income than their white and straight cisgender counterparts, especially people who belong to both communities, such as trans women of color. Zines are a natural outlet for that reason too, as to create a zine, you don't need much. You really only need a piece of paper and a pen um, or a tablet as we're about to see. The first fanzine was a sci-fi publication created by and for fans of a popular science fiction literary magazine, Amazing Stories. Um, and that was in the 1960s. Fans would discuss the stories and they'd suggest edits and, uh, sorry, it was in the 1930s, um, and write their own. It was a zine rather than a commercial publication due to copyright. Um, it would be a copyright violation to like sell fan works. Um, but if it's zine and it's like you're buying it under the table, then it, nobody's going to sue. Um, the history of fandom is deeply queer. Um, the most notable fanzines in the 1960s were produced by Star Trek fans, and a subgenre of Star Trek fanzines were those that imagined Spock and Kirk from the TV show in a romantic relationship. Nowadays, we have fan archives on the internet, uh, which makes it easier for fans to publish content and find each other. But in pre-internet days, there were zines distributed at fan clubs, full of art and stories. And a large part of fandom is queerness, um, from Spock and Kirk to Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes. The LGBTQ plus community has always looked at mainstream heterosexual fiction and imagined what it would look like if they could see themselves represented there. So zines have always been cheap to produce. Like I said, you really only need a piece of paper and a pen, um, but they have not always been cheap to mass produce. This changed in the 1970s uh, with the rise of copy, cop, copy shops. Another popular movement in the 1970s was the punk movement, and the two were a natural marriage. A publishing house, after all, is just another establishment. The results were pro-anarchy, anti-cop publications full of profanity. Another subject that traditional publishing houses were reluctant to tackle that naturally came out, pun intended, in zines was that of queerness. Uh, the LGBTQ plus community reacted in a very punk way against the cisgender heterosexual establishment and even uh, to the establishment within the gay community of white gay men who really just wanted marriage equality or equality within the military um, in an offshoot of the punk movement later labeled queer core. Queer core was a celebration of parts of the culture that weren't sanitized for the mainstream. The queer zine renaissance started in the 1970s and persisted through the early 2000s. 
members of the community were able to find each other through zines when it wasn't safe to come out publicly. Zines would be distributed at LGBTQ plus spaces and vice versa. Whole zines were created just to list which spaces were safe for members of the community to meet. In the 1980s, LGBTQ plus zines also had the important role of sharing information about the AIDS crisis. Reagan's government refused to acknowledge its existence, and a lot of mainstream news sources were biased and misinformed. Those who were most at risk could share information through zines about uh, how to prevent HIV and AIDS and what to do if you had it to prevent spreading it to others. They also found empowerment in the simple ability to tell their own stories. So um, today in the year 2020, um, a lot of zines have been replaced and functioned by the internet. LGBTQ plus people who are worried about the safety of coming out publicly can still find community anonymously on the internet. Marginalized artists who might be rejected by traditional publishing houses can publish their content on the internet. However, LGBTQ plus zines do prevail. Some zines are actually published on the internet. Um, and a lot of people choose, you know, to self-publish like novels on WordPress um, and web comics, um, which is very much still in the tradition of zines. Um, uh, LGBTQ plus and also straight and cisgender um, artists at conventions and art shows like to trade zines with other artists or sell them for a small fee, which is normally just the cost of printing. Um, you can also find them at independent bookstores like Busboys and Poets. Many of the conditions that necessitated the rise of LGBTQ plus zines still exist. People create them because they can't publish traditionally, so they turn to self-publishing. Um, a lot of people like to pay homage to the four parents who paved the way for us, and a lot of people really just like the punky homemade aesthetic. So if you are interested um, in zines and uh, the content that I've talked about, um, we have uh, a link to fire the first scene which is available the full text is available online um i also have a link to an auto straddle article which um shows uh 50 zines uh modern zines by queer people of color um and a lot of the art um that i used for this presentation came from the queer zine archive project which is a very interesting website and I encourage everyone to check that out. Um, within the library system, um, we have Hafrocentric, which is a fiction graphic novel that started out as a zine and is now available through the library. Um, curbside pickup, check it out today or probably tomorrow because you do have to make an appointment still. Um, it tackles subjects such as racism, patriarchy, and classism. It only mentions LGBTQ plus issues in passing, but it is very true to the anti-establishment uh, spirit of queer for. Um, and then we have Moxie, which is a fiction novel about a 16-year-old who starts a feminist revolution in a small Texas town using anonymous scenes. Um, and it is available uh, as an ebook, so you can download it today through Overdrive. Um, and then $100 and a t-shirt is a documentary that explores the world of zines in the Northwest. The creator used broken and borrowed equipment to film it and put it online himself. So basically it is sort of the film version of a zine and it is available through Canopy, one of our online resources. That is it for my presentation.
So now I'm going to show you how to physically make a zine using only a piece of paper and a pair of scissors. So what we're going to do is we're going to fold it widthwise, hamburger style. If you remember kindergarten folding terminology. Try to make sure everything, all the edges and corners are matching nicely. Grease it and then unfold. We're going to fold it lengthwise or hot dog style. And again, just try to make up everything, make sure everything matches. Um, it doesn't match perfectly, that's okay. This isn't origami. Unfold it, and then we're just gonna, like a book, we're gonna make sure the short edges meet in the middle. like this. Some people have like a fancy tool for flattening their creases. Um, I just use my fingernails. Or you can use like the um, handle of your scissors and just sort of run it along the crease to flatten it. And it should look like this when you're done with those folds. And then we're going to unfold it. And it's got eight little sort of mini sections. We're going to redo that hamburger fold. And then this is where our scissors come in. So there's this line right here between the fold and the center point, we're actually gonna cut along that line. Don't wanna cut all the way through to the edge. We just wanna make this one cut halfway through. Now I'm going to unfold it again. There's this nice little hole in the center. Redo the hot dog style fold. And then we're going to pinch on these two um, folds towards the edges and we're going to push the whole thing together and then look like a little little windmill um, and then uh, flatten it and then I'm going to fold it so that it looks like a little book or a little zine. Um, and you can see there are 
a lot of spaces for whatever you want to put in there. Illustrations, words, um, or a uh, little comic, as we're about to see from Natalie. So I am going to share a screen with you from my tablet, but you need to know that is only to make digital sharing easier. You can absolutely do this with pen and paper and it would be just as good. Only the host can share in this meeting. Oh my goodness, my bad. Let me fix that. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, I am going to pull up this very same uh, form that Ruya just showed you how to make. Now this one, I have uh, got it divided into the eight pieces so that I know where every fold is going to be. And they have also been numbered. You can see we've got page one, page two, page three, and page four. And then the others are upside down. That's because once we fold it, the fold in the middle is going to make the outer edges all become down. So we'll be looking at it from this orientation once it's all in place. You can see that the front and back covers are over here marked so that we know and together so that if we wanted to do a picture that covered both of them, this would be an easy way to do it. Your pages don't have to be in exactly this uh, formation, but you're always going to want to be aware that um, the second and the fourth blocks are going to be where a cover would be. So if you put your cover on the first block and hope for the best, your hopes are in vain. That's the back cover. All right. So Rui and I talked about a comic that I might make for you today, and it is going to be um, kind of autobiographical because this is History Month, and we thought maybe a personal history might be a direction we could go with a zine. The thing about making an eight-page zine is you cannot include very much information. This is not going to be a full autobiography. Your best bet is to go with something like a memoir, which is more about one particular topic in your life and your thoughts and your feelings about that, rather than all of the facts and dates that have combined into your life thus far. I've got this zine that I got at the Small Press Expo a couple years ago. I've shown it to you before. I love it very much. This is autobiographical. It is all about the author's interactions with her boss's dog. Very narrow scope, very high quality art. This larger one, Chainmail Bikini, is about women and non-binary people's experiences in gaming. Some of it's fictional, but a lot of it is autobiographical. The one we're doing today is about a haircut. That's it. That's the whole thing. Let's begin. All right, so we're gonna start with the front and back cover. And like I said, we are going to make it all one picture. I am going to uh, not draw on my form that I've got there in case I make a mistake, because I wanna be able to erase it without messing up my form. And I'm going to just start by writing the title, which is going to be hair. That is the only thing that is not negotiable about this project. <laughs> Very reminiscent of the uh, 80s musical. Yes, not negotiable. <laughs> and we are going to just grab a pen because y'all are going to be doing this with a pen at home, maybe. Maybe a crayon, I don't know. You might be coming at it crayon style. 
and we are going to write hair. There we go. Now, for the cover of this, my vibe was cover the whole thing in strands of hair. Ruya, how do you feel about that? Um, I think I need to see what it looks like. Okay. I'm going to just throw some hair up there. I'm ginger. I'm going to make it ginger hair. Mm, yeah, kind of like that, I guess. And it's just going to be like... When my hair is long, it is uh, semi-curly, mostly just fluffy. So it goes kind of like this all over everything. I like that. I'm partial to uh, representations of curly hair. Being a curly gal myself. I, I need you to understand that I never achieved where you are. I brushed it constantly and hoped for the best because I did not know a single thing. Yeah, I, uh, my mom used to uh, brush my hair um, while it was dry when I was little uh, because she had straight hair, did not know how to, what to do with curly hair. Um, so a lot of us curly gals kind of have to figure it out on our own. I never did though, so. <laughs> so that's the cover that I'm feeling. We can go back and we can change it if later on we decide that does not fit the vibe of the rest of the thing. Um, Great thing about digital art, you can do that. Well, see, they don't really have to do it digitally to get the advantage of this. If you are just planning on doing it pen and paper or crayon for my crayon folks out there pencil um you can do this on a piece of paper with a real live writing implement you can be planning on making copies on a copier you can just cut out a piece of paper and cover up those two before you make your copies and then put your new thing on there because before I had a tablet, which is very recent, that is exactly what I did, and I can tell you it works. It's fun. <laughs> there's sometimes a little there's sometimes a little shadow right at the fold line, but you know what? It's a Z, and that's fine. Okay, we're turning this over and we're gonna do page one. The way that this is going to be formatted is there's going to be um three pages of, wait, no, let me count. Um, that one, that one, that one. There's gonna be four pages of individual comics and then pages five and six are going to be one larger uh, centerfold type dealie. And I'm going to write the text and I'm going to ask Ruya to help me create these iconic pictures that everyone's going to be talking about later. I'm going to be coming back with a uh, dark color so it's easier for people to see it. Okay. Got a little so, bit of a typo in there. What? You used the wrong. Oh my gosh! Look at me. <laughs> I'm a librarian. Who who authorized this script? <laughs> I mean, I was an English major, and I always like to say, you know, in college, when you study English, nobody t gives you like. I never had the option of taking a grammar class. So when people are like, you should know better, you're a librarian and an English major, I'm like, well, American schooling, man. 
I'm going to chalk it up to stress. And I'm also going to ask that people not razz me about my handwriting because I know that's terrible. Oh, no, actually, I think it looks really nice. Uh, <laughs> I have it, really bad It handwriting. feels in keeping with the kind of homespun vibe of Absolutely. a Z. Yeah. But if you wanted to take your time and make it neat, there's value in that too. So I am going to draw a self-portrait of me as a child and I'm going to ask you to be respectful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it so far. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. Me. There we go. That's good. Uh, that, uh, the hair is the same size as the rest of you. Well, see, that's that's the thing. My hair has always taken up too much space in my life. It's about 50% uh, hair, 50% person. Great. Okay. I'm, re I'm really feeling it so far. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and we're going to introduce a second character, which is pretty wild for a comic that's got six pages plus a cover, but we're going to do it. I have faith in you. Th thank you. I really do appreciate that. Okay. Now I'm going to be hyper vigilant about my belly. Here we go. I'm also trying to be mindful of my kerning. I want people to be able to read it, but I also want the text to take up kind of the same amount of space and kind of, I want it to be justified from edge to edge. I don't want there to be uh, weird gaps. We'll have to see if I can keep that up because uh, I do not remember how long the next sentence is. We're just gonna, we're winging this whole thing. It's, <laughs> it's fine. But we do need to draw a picture of my grandmother. So let's, uh... yes, that is a grandmother. Here we go. Well, that's not going to work. It gets onto page one. Got to be a little bit more careful there. And what she told me was that my hair was my glory. And that's a weird thing to say, but I love her a lot. So I'm just, I just rolled with it, but it was a weird thing to say. I mean, I think um, a lot of parents and parental figures uh, like to uh, almost like take possession of their uh, the hair of people, their child figures, their children or grandchildren, um, especially people their children who are like female or assigned female at birth like my my uh my hair is like one of the only things that um my my mom was very careful to not give me like too much feedback about my appearance because she was like you know if i give her too much like if i give her too many compliments she'll be you know like she'll be too who anxious about maintaining that 
Um, and if I give her too few compliments, um, she'll feel like she's not attractive. But um, my mom would always talk about my hair and how beautiful it was. Um, and uh, all the adults in my life would be like, you can never cut your hair. Like you can never straighten your hair. Um, it's, you know, it's your, it's your most attractive feature. Um, so I really relate to this comic so far. Um, so I did add my grandmother because I don't think that this was like a bad thing, but it was something that really stuck with me in kind of a weird way. When you are writing your own memoirs, feel free to protect the innocent. If someone said something dumb to you years ago, feel free to make that be an anonymous person instead of, because you've got relationships in your real life that you want to maintain and putting someone on blast for something weird they said when you were a child may or may not be one of your life goals. You need to know that, um, like if an autobiography is trying to be a photograph of your life, a memoir is kind of like an impressionist painting. It's about the, the feelings, the vibes of the whole thing instead of needing to pin down with a tag, this is what you said to me and I have the receipt and we're going to talk about it now. I mean, if that's what you want to do, then that's what you want to do, but you don't have to do that and it's fine. Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. Um, I've also like, um, for like creative nonfiction that I've written, um, I'll like combine characters. Like if like mm -hmm. said things to me in the same theme, um, but they're not necessarily major characters in my life. I'll just combine them into one person. Um, if, you know, a fictional name. So nobody, nobody, no. They probably don't even remember that they said the thing to me. They'll be like, who was, uh, you know, John Jinkelheimer Smith in your life? I don't remember somebody, but mm -hmm. In an unrelated story, how do you draw hands? What are they? <laughs> um, I think that looks like a hand. It looks, it's, it looks like a Baby Yoda's hand. It does look like, good heavens, it does look like Baby Yoda's hand. Um, but, he do, but he does have hands. So I think that qualifies. I mean, that's valid. That is very valid. I'm going <laughs> to move... Oops, I'm gonna move this down because I'm seeing a theme that I want to continue with. So over here on page one, I'm taking up about two thirds of the page with my character. And on page two, I'm being weighed down by the words and I'm taking up 40% maybe? I think I'm going to go down further on this one, so I'm going to bring this hand down a little bit more. If I had thought about this, I would have uh, maybe drafted out the whole thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a draft, but then there's nothing wrong with doing it live, so we're doing it live. And I'm going to add a little tiny Natalie here. No room for a face anymore, just eyes. Oops. Bounce. Body there. It's stylized. Um, it I also just really like that the the hand looks like um, one of those like uh, like a claw machine. The claw claw machine. That Coming down from above. Very yeah. Mm -hmm. When people ask, we will say that's why I drew that hand like that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Every yeah. uh, happy accident was uh, retroactively intentional. Yes.
Oh, and now the words. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> oh, the horror of people thinking that I, I might not be heterosexual. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Also, me with a shot that said to me, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hey, I'm gonna. There, I am falling off the page. And now we're going to have our double page. So one uh, suggestion, actually, okay. quick suggestion that I have. Um, I, because I can see the progression of large Nat Natalie, smaller Natalie, um, in the flat layout, I can tell mm -hmm. what the last illustration is meant to be, but I feel like it would be easier to tell if you colored the hair red, like the hair on the cover. Oh, brilliant. Let's do that really quick. Um, I'm going to, because it's weird, I'm going to just do that on a separate layer. But again, you don't have to use layers. You can just use paper and that's cool. I'm just going to. And if you were using paper, you wouldn't have to think about this weird white line that I have to go fix in a minute, but which I'm probably not going to go fix in a minute. <laughs> okay, how, how's this going? It looks great. Um, gonna pull back to the black and... That's dumb, Natalie. What are you doing? Stop that. <laughs> that does not fit the vibe of the rest of the writing at all. I liked it. It was a very fancy W. <laughs> well, hey, okay. This is a different person talking. They talk uh, differently. <laughs> they are going to come at it with a kind of a... Um, Like I said, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a curl, even if it's part of the font. Mm, don't like that, Kay. Coming back out of that one. Yeah, that's good. Oh, that is not good. Shoot. Hey, so what does what does a razor look like? <laughs> um, um, that's a great question. I think I think I can tell what it is. It could also kind of be like a. I have like a like an exfoliating like electric brush. Um, but oh, great, it's labeled, so now we know it's labeled. Um, because <laughs> I mean, it does look like a toothpaste with fringe, is kind of the vibe that I am getting, and I've just like squirted it everywhere. <laughs> but if it says clippers, then no, I think I think it's obvious now. <laughs> okay, all right, no, it looks good. <laughs> Hmm. Counterintuitive, but I'm going to turn it over to draw. Oh, good heavens. 
I'm not trying arms ever, except for the one that is the claw hand from the machine. But there is a bound to uh, how terrible I can make a body and still look at myself in the mirror and feel okay. I'm gonna give a little time. And let's come back. This guy. This isn't strictly 100% everything involved in my decision to go ahead and shave my hair, but <laughs> it's a lot of it. So, hmm. All right. I like photorealistic it's thank you like i can't even tell like which natalie is the one on the camera and which one is the drawing i appreciate that because not everybody knows uh how hard i worked on this comic i'm <laughs> it really uh blood sweat and tears we've made a million cuts away while i did uh frantic research and redrew everything several times um, your idea about the hair was so good because now there's kind of an even black and orange balance across the whole thing. And it's not just um, that you're able to put a line down. There's also kind of like, you should have an idea of how you want it to look and how to make it compelling to people. Because you could just be doing it as therapy and that's fine. But if you're making multiple copies of a zine and you want people to look at it, you should make it nice to look at. Which it is. I think this looks really great. Um, I think you have like a cute little cartoony style. Um, and I also love, by the way, um, that like the pieces of hair are on both the front and back covers because it feels like when you're looking at it, like at the beginning you're like oh like that's just like that's just like hair that's like part of like a person's scalp and when you're looking at it at the end it feels more like uh pieces of hair that are like on the uh floor of like a hair salon or uh, uh. yeah <laughs> is in meaning i like that uh when you've got when you've got like an eight page one, I really like it when it's just like the setup and payoff of kind of a joke. Cause it's a really good length for that. Yeah. You can make absolutely. a longer one that's about how, Hey, did you also know I donated my hair to people uh, three times? And can I tell you about the time that I got a haircut and I got more than 100 comments on it because I started keeping track after the first few because it got weird and then it oh got really God. weird. And then I was like, okay, I guess this is public property and not my actual head that's attached to me. But there's no room for that kind of thing in eight pages. Eight pages, you go in, you say your thing, and then you just leave because there's no there's no room after that. Thank you so much for coming to our zine workshop. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and we hope that you um, watch more of our virtual programming um, and uh, visit the library to take advantage of curbside pickup during this uh, time of closure. See ya.